After all the amazing events of the last few chapters of Genesis, if you've been with us, you'll know exactly what we're talking about. Well, we, the flood and the ark and all of that, after all those amazing cataclysmic events and, and the, the rescue of this, these eight people and pairs of every animal and every bird, after all of that, we come, round, we come down to earth rather with a bump in this chapter, don't we? The inhabitants of the earth have just been wiped out by the flood. This one family has been saved. The family we're reading about here. Everyone else, everything else that breathes has been, is, is gone. And now on this cleansed, renewed earth, Noah plants a vineyard, makes wine and gets completely drunk. And lies about naked in his tent. Now there's no doubt this is a sorry episode, but as we'll, as we'll see, good things emerge from it, as we, as, we, uh, as we hope we'll see towards the end of it. Good things of great relevance to us here today. Well, I'd like to divide my time up this morning into two blocks. I'd like to look first of all at Noah's shame, and secondly I'd like to look at Noah's prophecy concerning his sons. Noah's shame and his prophecy concerning his sons. First of all, let's look at Noah's shame then. Sometimes when you're reading narrative in the Bible, narrative is those parts of the Bible that's, that's telling a storyline. It doesn't have to be a made-up story. It's, it's, it's history. You know, the history here, we have here, much of the Bible is history, storyline, but it's, it's narrative, and so much of it n- narrates events without telling us, and that was a bad thing. He shouldn't have done that. It doesn't always stop to tell us those things. Now, sometimes we might wish it would, especially sometimes you get into Judges or something like that where it gets very dark. Some really dark, horrible things happen in Judges and you might wish that the narrator had just made it a bit more obvious that was a a bad thing. But actually, I think it would make rather dull reading if, if there were relentlessly moral comments dropped here, there and everywhere. And sometimes it says it in more subtle ways. And I think that's what's going on here. It doesn't say, and Noah shouldn't have done that, because it's clear, if we just think about it for a moment. In the innocence back of chapter 2, in the innocence of, of the world without sin, there was no shame when Adam and Eve were naked. We're told that. In the world of Genesis chapters 1 and 2, there's no shame whatsoever in their nakedness. But following their sin in chapter 3, they suddenly realise that they've got to cover themselves up. They feel the shame now. And so now, nakedness is associated with shame. And here in the renewed earth, Noah has reduced himself to this state of shame by overindulging in alcohol. Now, it's not alcohol or wine itself that the Bible disapproves of. It's over-drinking getting yourself into this sort of state. It's over-drinking and the shameful things that people do when they're completely drunk. Let's just briefly look at some of the positive things that the Bible says about wine. And I say this because occasionally I've bumped into one or two of in a supermarket and occasionally I've noticed that you feel rather defensive about the bottles that are jingling in your trolleys when you look at me. It's quite amusing. It's fine as long as you don't overdo it, as long as you don't get yourself in this sort of state. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 14, now this is interesting, this is, about, this is about tithes. What were the Israelites to do with their tithes? Deuteronomy chapter 14, the second half of that chapter, they were to enjoy it. They were to eat and drink it. Imagine that. And, and they were to do that at the place where God was going to put his name, and that means the temple, basically, or the tabernacle. And if it was too far away, you'd sell what you had, your tithe, then you'd take money to it because that was easier to carry. And then when you got there, you'd buy whatever you wanted. Strong drink, fine, it says. Have a look at Deuteronomy 14. It's quite amazing. Strong drink, meat, whatever, grain, oil. Have a great meal. Have some enjoyable wine, some enjoyable strong drink. It's alcoholic stuff. That's fine. In Psalm 104, verses 14 to 15, it says, The Lord causes plants to grow, so that mankind can bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man. It's okay to enjoy. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23, Paul advises Timothy to take a little wine for his stomach. Notice there, a little wine, so not absolutely gallons of the stuff. And this is a medicinal sort of thing, isn't it? 
Now, is it just medicinal thing that the Bible's encouraging? No. Jesus didn't drink wine medicinally. He was known for drinking wine. Not known for getting drunk, no, but known for drinking and eating. And so you can look at Matthew 11, verse 19. In fact, of course, Jesus turned water into wine, didn't he? He made the stuff at one of his first miracles in Cana of Galilee, that that wedding banquet. Why did he do that? Because that wedding banquet was, it reminded him of his own wedding banquet. A little foretaste of the final great wedding banquet that he was going to enjoy when he and his bride came together at the end of time. And so he makes wine, because wine is a foretaste, a little sort of, there's something about wine which is a, is a foreminder of that great wedding banquet of Christ and his bride, the church. And so the Bible has a very positive attitude towards wine itself, but a very negative attitude towards over-drinking it. And so you get in Isaiah 5.22, Woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine. That's very contemporary sounding, isn't it? Wine, you know, alcoholic games. Who can drink the most? I'm sure that goes on nowadays. I know it goes on nowadays. In Proverbs 23, you get more on wine. Ephesians 5, verse 18, Do not get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. So, wine in our passage. Clearly a negative thing, because Noah has overdone it. He's drunk too much. He's blotto. He doesn't know what's going on. He's lost all his inhibitions. He's lost his sense of shame. He's lying around naked. And he's unaware of what he's doing until he wakes up in verse 24. Now, this is a big letdown, isn't it, for this righteous, blameless man. He was, he was known to be righteous and blameless. We saw that in chapter 6, verse 9. And yet here he is, this righteous, blameless man, completely drunk. Noah played this crucial role, didn't he, in, the, in, the, in, in God's dealings with the world. We can see that in verse 19. Noah and his sons, from this, the whole earth is going to be scattered and filled again with, with human life. He plays a key role as a, as a father figure to the whole human race. Lamech, his father, certainly had high hopes for Noah. You can see that as he named Noah in chapter 5, verse 29. Through Noah, and in, in, it's quite right, isn't it? Through Noah, the whole human race was given a future. But Noah is clearly not the hero that the book of Genesis wants us to have our hopes in. The book of Genesis has primed us to look for a serpent crusher. In chapter 3, verse 15. Somebody's going to crush the head of the serpent. Who's the serpent? The serpent is the one in chapter 3 who led the whole world catastrophically into sin. It's Satan. It's the sin monger, if you like. The one who wants to spread sin as much as possible and spread all of its catastrophic death as well. And so since Genesis 3, verse 15, we've, we've been desperately looking for someone to defeat sin, to undo the work of the serpent and crush him. We need a serpent crusher. Noah clearly isn't a serpent crusher. He is quite obviously that, as he lies inebriated in his tent, stark naked. The serpent could only be crushed by someone who wouldn't buy into his own his lies, Satan's lies, and, and his spin, and give in to sin. And yet, no, here, here, here is clearly someone who's given in to sin. He's overcome by sin, blind, drunk, lying naked. Noah was overcome by sin, but Christ wasn't, was he? Christ overcame every temptation that's flung at him by Satan. You see that in Matthew 4. As Jesus is tempted in the desert, and at every turn Jesus says, No, I am not going to go along with your sin-mongering. Satan was completely unable to lead Christ into sin. Completely unable to do it. Christ defeated him at every turn. And so Christ, millennia down the line from Genesis, is the one that the book of Genesis wants, to put our, wants us to put our hope in. He's the serpent crusher. He's the one who's defeated all of Satan's sin-mongering. Satan wreaked havoc, leading humanity into our sin and our death. We've seen that in the flood, haven't we? Just how much destruction wickedness and sin causes. Satan was rubbing his hands at the flood. Slightly disappointed about the ark, probably. 
that Christ has crushed Satan and ruined Satan's plans. It was on the cross that Jesus achieved that, as we've just been thinking in the communion service. On the cross, Christ took away our sins and gave us an everlasting future. How did he do that? By taking the shame of our sin onto onto himself. Think of Noah lying in his tent. Noah's lying in his tent naked, shamed with his own sin. Think of Christ on the cross. Christ is hanging on the cross, naked, shamed at our sin. Doing that to take away the shame of our sin forever. By taking it onto himself in a shameful death and rising again from it. That's how he ruined Satan's work. That's how he undid the fall and gave us an everlasting future. Christ did what Noah didn't have a hope of doing. Christ is the hero of the book of Genesis, not Noah. The book of Genesis strains forwards to someone better than Noah. Well, it does at this point anyway. Strains forwards to someone better. Someone who's not going to give in to sin and get into that shameful state. And there is someone, Christ, the sin conqueror, the serpent crusher. (coughs) Hallelujah, what a saviour, as we sang earlier. Is your hope in Christ? Do you trust in Christ as the only one who's got to the root of this world's problems? Do you trust in Christ to save you from your own sin and death? Maybe there's someone here this morning who's answering those questions, yes, 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 with a conviction that they've never had before. If that's you, do tell me afterwards. and I'd love to help you to grow in your new life in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look then, secondly, at Noah's prophecy concerning his sons. Noah sobers up, doesn't he? Sobers up and gets dressed. And he finds out what's happened. He finds out what his sons did while he was drunk and naked. He hears how his son Ham saw him naked and went to tell the other brothers about the spectacle. Have you seen what Dad's done? Have you seen the pickle he's in? Have a look. The others, however, refused to be party to it and they got Noah covered up, didn't they? Walking backwards to make sure that they don't see their father in his shame. Noah learns about all of this as he wakes from his stupor, probably with a great big headache. And Noah responds to his son's actions with a prophecy, and that prophecy in verses 25 to 27. Now it might seem to us rather bizarre that Noah is prophesying here. He's probably still hungover, isn't he? How can he be prophesying after what he's done? And maybe our curiosity wants to know whether Noah had any remorse about what he'd done. And our narrator refuses to pander to our curiosity. Completely silent. We don't know whether Noah regretted and repented of what he did. We're simply not told whether Noah was being a hypocrite or not. That's not the concern of the author. And so we need to hear the author's concerns. What's the author's concerns? The author's concern is to do with the future of the human race. And it's all bound up in these three sons and their descendants who are going to come from them. And so we need to listen carefully to what this prophecy is about. It's going to tell us about the distant future from their point of view. It's going to tell us about us from our point of view, our, our time from our point of view. And so Noah's prophecy about each son reaches far into the future. Let's look at each in turn then, these three sons, what is prophesied about them. Firstly then, let's look at the the one who did what was wrong. Ham had shamed his father and Noah was rightly unhappy with that. But notice it's Ham's son Canaan that Noah condemns. It's there in verse 25, cursed be Canaan. So in verse verse, uh, 26, let Canaan be Shem's servant. Let Cain be Japheth's servant, verse 27. And we're told twice that Ham is the father of Canaan in verses 18 and 22. 
And so it's Canaan that Noah homes in on. Why is that? Well, he's been led to, it seems, prophetically by the Spirit to do that. He's foretelling here the future of the line of Canaan. That they'd increase in the sin of their ancestor, Ham. And they're going to come under a crushing judgment as a result. If you look at Leviticus 18, it gives us a catalogue of sins to avoid, well, sins for the Israelites to avoid, as they go into the land of Canaan. And it says that these are the things that the Canaanites do. And so you can find out from Leviticus 28, Leviticus 28, what sort of things the Canaanites got up to. Things like incest of all sorts, sexual relations with father, mother, uncle, uh, aunt, grandchildren, sister. They got up to homosexual, is that homosexuality? They got up to adultery with their neighbours' wives. They got up to bestiality. Sexual relations with animals. That's what Canaan, the Canaanite nation, got up to. And as a result of these things, God judges them severely. God destroyed the Canaanites through Joshua and the Israelites. And he gave their land and their cities and their houses and their the vineyards and their olive groves to the Israelites as a free gift. You can read about that in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 10 and 11. Or Joshua 24, verses 11 to 23. And so it's in this devastating way that Canaan becomes a servant of servants to his brothers, especially to Shem, or whose, whose, whose descendants are, are the Israelites, the, the Semitic race, the Israelites. And so Canaan becomes a servant of servants. How? By being destroyed and all his property being given over. And so this puts it kindly, doesn't it? This, this curse that is mentioned in verse 25 actually is an understatement of what really is going to happen to the nation of Canaan. They, they're crushed, they're ground to a powder. They're devoted to destruction. You can read about it in, in um, the book of Joshua. And everything that the, that the, the nation of Canaan had worked for, all their property is given to the Israelites. Maybe Ham's sin in verse 22 seems fairly innocuous to us. Maybe it makes us smile inwardly. And think, oh. <laughs> Maybe you're doing sins that seem fairly innocuous to you. You don't really think they're serious, anything to worry about, really. But this whole incident with what begins in Ham and grows to what the Canaanites gets up to, reminds us that sin is not innocuous, even when it's small and innocuous seeming to us. One of the things you see in, in the early part of the Bible is how sin snowballs. Little sins go to big sins. We've seen it already in the line of Cain and how it ends up with Lamech. Not, not Lamech, Noah's father, but a different Lamech. And how he rejoices in killing a young lad. Sin snowballs. Don't be content to live with what you might think of as little sins. Repent of them. Get rid of them. Remember the serpent crusher. The sin conqueror. He doesn't put up with sin. He doesn't tolerate a single, anything, any sin. He's not willing to go do any small sin himself. The Lord Jesus is going to crush not just Satan, but everyone who persists in their sin. Have a listen to this from the New Testament. Revelation chapter 19, verse 15. The Lord Jesus there treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God. The winepress of the fury of the wrath of God. And a, a quite a sobering passage from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6. Listen to this, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 to 11. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Paul here is writing to a Christian church who are doing things that they shouldn't be doing. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. 
neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were, says Paul to the Corinthians. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So don't let sin in your life seem insignificant to you. Cut it out. Get rid of it. You've been washed from it. It has no place among the people of God. We're never completely going to eradicate sin in these bodies while we live in them. But we have to be constantly struggling with it and not just going with it, not just happy to continue in it. Okay, we've, seen, we've uh, considered Noah's dire prophecy about Canaan. Let's finally look at what Noah says about Shem and Japheth. And we'll take these two together. Verse 26. Noah also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. In these few lines, in those two verses, we have a prophetic summary of the whole vista of the Old Testament and the New Testament, respectively. Take blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, verse 26. That is the Old Testament in a nutshell. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. God was to choose one nation and associate his name with them. And so this God of Shem here is a precursor to that. Later it's going to be the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And that's how God reveals himself to Moses at the burning bush at that crucial moment when God comes down to rescue his people out of Egypt. He introduces himself to Moses through whom he's going to do it and he says, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, descendants of Shem. And later, in the giving of the law, as, as a, after they've been brought out of Egypt, the Israelites are brought to Mount Sinai, they're given the law, and how is the law prefaced? How does the Lord introduce himself, as it were, to the nation he's rescued? He says, I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord your God, the God of Israel. And throughout Deuteronomy, throughout the whole law, God, in, God describes himself as the Lord your God, the God of Israel, the descendants of Shem. What's, God's, what's the favourite phrase for describing God in the book of Isaiah? The Holy One of Israel. So, the, so when God here is described as the God of Shem, Shem is the ancestor of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, Israel, and that nation that came from the patriarchs. They're the Semitic race, the Shemitic race. That, that comes from Shem, the name Shem. So God is the God of Shem, the God of the Semitic nation, the Jews. But then in the New Testament, with the coming of Christ to do his work, the Gentiles are brought in. And that's verse 27. Japheth comes to live in the tents of Shem. It's the New Testament. This is talking about us here today. People who believe in Jesus Christ, whose trust is in Jesus Christ. We are Japheth living in the tents of Shem. Salvation is from the Jews. Jesus says that quite clearly to the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. So we've been brought in. Paul in Ephesians chapter 2 says that Gentiles were once far off, alienated, cut off, separate, away from the commonwealth of what? Of Israel. Away from the commonwealth of Israel, this nation God chose in the Old Testament. But now, says Paul, writing to Gentile believers in Ephesians, you've been brought near, brought in, through the blood of Christ. Once far off, now brought in. Brought into the tent of Shem, as it were. Salvation coming from the Jews. 
Now the Bible uses a rich array of images to describe the inclusion of the Gentiles into God's covenant of grace which began with the Jews. Here's just some of them. I really enjoyed going through the Bible and looking through all of these. This is selected highlights. Okay. Romans chapter 11, verses 17 and 14. We Gentiles are wild olive shoots grafted into a cultivated olive plant. We're wild. You know, we've been grafted into and now we're joined in and we have our sap from the root, as it were. Salvation coming from the Jews through Christ. Luke chapter 13, verse 18. This is a favourite one of mine. It talks about birds nesting in the tree. This is the, this is the parable of the mustard seed. The mustard seed grows into this tree. It's describing the kingdom of God. And who comes and nests in the tree? Birds do. Birds. Others come and live under the shelter, under the shelter and protection of the kingdom of God. Others being Gentiles. Matthew chapter 8, verse 11. It says there that many will come from east and west, and Luke adds north and south as well, many will come from all points of the compass and be brought in to sit with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of God. They're brought into the tents of Shem. Luke chapter 14 talks about the fact that we Gentiles are late invitees to the great banquet. There was a first round of invites that went out to the Jews. And a lot of those got rejected. No thanks, I'm busy. And so God is angry and in his anger he, he gives out a second wave of invites to whoever will come, to the, anyone. And out goes the second wave of invites to the great banquet. To come to the banquet into the tents of Shem. Salvation is from the Jews. Because Christ came from that line. Christ is the son of Shem. And he brings us sons of Japheth to live in his tent. In Christ we have a secure future and a home. Provided for forever. Because he's the victor over sin. He's our saviour. And so, I think majestically, the whole, of, the whole sweep of salvation history is encompassed in verses 26 and 27. The history of the Old Testament in verse 26 and the history of the New Testament in Verse 27. History of the Old Testament in blessed be the God of Shem. History of the New Testament in let's have Japheth come and live in the tents of Shem. And the thing that hinges between those two verses, as it were, is the coming of the Messiah. The coming of the Messiah in the line of Shem to do his work, to conquer sin and crush the serpent and bring Japheth, Gentiles, to live in the tent. I think it's wonderful stuff. And finally, verse 27, may God enlarge the tents of Shem. Sorry, may, may God enlarge Japheth. More must come in. More must come in. There's that wonderful little line in, I alluded to in my prayer earlier, Luke 24, verse 23. My house must be full, says God. My house must be full. It's not. More must come in. May God enlarge Japheth. May God increase the refugees who come under the wing of the victorious Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. We pray, Father, this message that we've heard this morning of Christ, the one who's conquered sin and defeated it utterly in every aspect. We pray this would encourage us this coming week, those of us who've put our hope in him. We thank you for the privilege of being in that last wave of invites that's gone out, bringing in Gentiles into this great salvation. We thank you that for the privilege of being included, being brought near, taking refuge in the fortress of a serpent crusher, we pray that the things that we've looked at this morning, many things, we pray that these things would encourage us in whatever s situations we're facing today and in this week ahead. And if there are those who are still outside, who are still far away, cut off, we pray you'd bring them in as well. Bring them into the shelter and provision and glory of 
the tents of Shem through Christ. We thank you for our Lord Jesus. Amen.